And it looks like we're live on Facebook and uh, appreciate those of you who maybe have been hanging around for a few extra moments waiting for us to get started and uh, thank you for joining us. This is not the Joel Osteen channel, so if you were <laughs> surfing the internet looking for that, we're, we apologize, but uh, hope you'll stick around and maybe even send your offerings and tithes our way uh, this week. But uh, welcome to all who are watching and uh, we invite you to join us on the YouVersion Bible app where you'll find our scripture and the uh, uh, outline uh, that we'll be following along today as we continue our series. And uh, for those of you who are here, we hope that you'll open your Bibles and join us as well uh, or on the YouVersion Bible app as we continue this series called Restored Identity, reclaiming uh, our identity that God ascribes to us in the scripture. And I want to just begin with the story of an elderly woman who visited a, a small country church and a friendly usher helped her up the steps and asked her where she would like to sit. And she replied, I, I would like to sit in the front row, please. And uh, in a very quiet tone, he said, oh, ma'am, if you don't mind me saying, you don't want to do that. And she said, why not? Well, our pastor's kind of boring. She said rather indignantly, young man, do you know who I am? He said, no. He said, I, she said, I'm the preacher's mother. He said, well, do you know who I am? She said, no. He said, good. <laughs> 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 See, every church, every time we assemble, we, we have to deal with our identity issues. And we gather around the Lord's table like we did just a few moments ago to remind ourselves who we are. And, and, and that we are, as we've already studied this far, the saints of God. We're aliens and strangers in this world. We, we are slaves of Christ. We've been set free from sin, and now we're free to choose to make Jesus the master of our lives. And we proclaim this identity, and we commit ourselves to be a part of the way. You see, in the earliest days of this revolution that was started by Jesus, nobody called this movement the Christian church. They were called the way. And I don't know when or why we lost that name, but I fear that when we did, we lost something very important in regards to what it means to follow Jesus Christ. We stopped being in the way. And we got stuck. So this morning I want us to reconsider what it might mean if we got that name back. What blessings might it bring to us? Well, I think one uh, blessing would be that the way resists all attempts to turn this movement into nothing more than a monument. You see, Jesus established this new, wild, radical movement of people. But today, most people think when they become a Christian, well, they've reached some sort of a destination. You know, they went on a journey. They were seeking after God, and they found him. And now that they're a Christian, it's done. And they stop. Well, in the early days, people understood that becoming a Christian was not as much about reaching a destination as it was beginning a new journey. For them to be a Christian was to enter into a lifelong trek of following Jesus and learning to be in the way of Jesus. In fact, his last words to his disciples on this earth was, I want you to go out into the world and make disciples. I want you to go to all the ethnic groups of the world. I want you to preach the gospel to them. I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then I want you to teach them what it means to follow in my way. Now, Jesus didn't say, and, and guys understand, now that's going to be too much for some people. So you're going to have to really deal with two different groups when you do that. The big group is going to be called Christians, and they're just going to get baptized, and they're just going to kind of stay where they are, thinking that they have arrived. But there'll be another group, a small, much smaller group, a more radical group, that's going to be called disciples, and they're going to keep growing and growing and learning and moving along the way. That's not what Jesus was saying. 
The word disciple means learner. And you are never going to learn all that there is to learn in your life because a disciple understands they never arrive. And by the way, neither do churches. The church never arrives. Amen. The church is always growing and changing as it asks the question in every age, in every culture, what does it mean for us to follow Jesus right here, right now? And so the church is constantly changing and growing and moving because to follow Christ is to commit to a life of movement in the way. Now, Jesus called this way the narrow way. He said up front, it's not going to be popular with most people. In fact, if you're in the way, it probably means you're out of step with most of the majority in our culture. And resistance to the way should therefore be expected. I find it significant that every time that phrase, the way, is used in the book of Acts, it's always found in the context of conflict. Let's just walk through a few of those examples and I'll show you what I mean. The very first time that phrase, the way, is used is in Acts chapter 9. It's speaking of Saul, who was still at this point wanting to persecute Christians, followers of Jesus. And it says in Acts chapter 9, he requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way that he found there. But as you know the story, uh, Saul became Paul the preacher, and in Acts chapter 19, he's in Ephesus, he's in the synagogue, and notice this time, he's teaching and preaching about the same Jesus he wanted to persecute earlier. Acts 19 verse 9 says, But some became stubborn, rejecting Paul's message, and publicly speaking against the way. So Paul left the synagogue and took the believers with him. So Paul leaves the synagogue and starts preaching out on the streets of Ephesus. But this created even more problems because many Gentiles were converted to Jesus in Ephesus. And that means they left their idol worship. And that hurt the pocketbooks of the local idol makers. And so it says in Acts 19 verse 23 about that time serious trouble developed in Ephesus concerning the way. Now later, Paul is arrested in Jerusalem. The Jews are upset with him and he begins to share his personal testimony. And he says in Acts 22, and I persecuted the followers of the way, hounding some of them to death, arresting both men and women, throwing them into prison. And later he's giving his testimony before a Roman official. And he says in uh, the later chapters, but I admit, that I follow the way, which many call a cult. Notice how often the word follow accompanies that phrase, the way. To be in the way means that there is going to be movement. There's going to be growth. There's going to be change. And every time you find that description of the early Christians in the book of Acts, it's always in the context of conflict which implies that the majority of people you and I will run into in life will not be in the way. The majority will actually be against the way. So the early Christians did not make life easy on themselves by getting in the way, did they? So why would they choose this road less traveled? I think they had two non-negotiable convictions that compelled them to do so. The first was their belief that Jesus is the only way to God. Amen. See, all religions are attempting to answer the same question. How can a man find his way back to God? And the first Christians were willing to die for their conviction that Jesus was the only right answer to that question. They understood exactly what their master meant when he said in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except 
through me. Now, please notice Jesus did not say, I show the way to the Father. That's what all other religions claim to do. All other religious leaders claim to show the way to God. You name the founder, that's what they claim to do. But Jesus didn't say, I am showing the way. Neither did he say, and I'm one of many ways. He said, I am the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. You don't get to God except you come through me. And it was this conviction that became the early church's mandate. And that's why they went to other countries. And that's why they had conflict with people about religion. Because they didn't believe, those early Christians, that all religions were basically teaching the same thing. And that it's all just a bunch of different ways to get to God. No, they would go to people in these different countries and they would say to them, you need to leave your way, whatever that way is. You need to leave your way and you need to get in this way. And people hear preaching like that and say, Whew, that makes uh, Christianity pretty exclusive, doesn't it? Well, I've got news for you. Every religion is exclusive. That's why it exists. The reason it exists is because that religion says we know a way that you don't know and you need to get into this way. All religions teach that they are the way. But the difference is this. Every other religion says, look, there's this gulf between you and God and we'll show you a way to build a bridge across that gulf so that you can reach God. You follow our tenets, you practice our principles, you believe our beliefs, and you can build that bridge that will eventually get you to God. Well, I find it interesting that when Paul was preaching in the book of Acts, chapter 14, he was preaching in a city where people worshiped all sorts of different ways. They had idols to every God imaginable. And this was Paul's message to them. He said, we have come to bring you the good news that you should turn from these worthless things and turn to the living God who made heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. In the past, he permitted all nations to go their own ways, but he never left them without evidence of himself and his goodness. For instance, he sends you rain and good crops and gives you food and joyful hearts. In other words, Paul was saying to these idol worshipers, God has never been without a witness. He's always given you a reason to question your way. God's goodness and faithfulness to you and the conscience that he gave you has always been present to cause you to wonder if you are in the right way. And the problem with all other ways is that they are, again, teaching you how to build the bridge. But, you know, no matter how hard you try, the bridge is never going to be long enough for you to reach God. Look at this picture with me. This is a photo of uh, a part of the Donghai Bridge in China. It cost $1.2 billion. They claim it's the largest sea bridge in the world. Now, there are some folks in Louisiana, however, that would point to the Lake Pontchartrain Bridge and say, no, this is the longest sea bridge in the world. And the Chinese would say, yeah, but technically you're a lake bridge going across Lake Pontchartrain. We're actually a sea bridge. And so they, they kind of go back and forth about who has built the biggest bridge. That's kind of like what all other religions in the world are doing. They're arguing our religion builds the longest bridge. But what if everything you are able to do to build a bridge still isn't long enough to reach God? Christianity comes along and says, good news, God has built the bridge. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10 says, and so dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. All religions
theologians do not teach the same thing. The rest teach, here's what you do. We'll show you how to build your bridge. Christianity, on the other hand, says you can't build a bridge long enough to get to God. It has to be built by God himself. Let me ask you a question. If all the different religions in the world are basically just different ways to get to the same God, then why was the cross of Jesus necessary? What kind of God sits on a throne in heaven and watches his own son get brutally tortured and murdered if it wasn't absolutely necessary because there are all sorts of ways to get to him? Well, the answer is there aren't other ways. Listen to Romans chapter 3. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard, yet God, who with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. No other religious leader in history has ever claimed that he or she was qualified to take away your sins, but Jesus did. There is a way to God, and that way is splattered with the blood of the Lamb. And our first brothers and sisters were willing to go to prison and even die for the conviction that Jesus is the only way to God. But that's not all they believed. The second non-negotiable conviction that compelled them was their belief that Jesus is the best way to live life today. And they understood that the way Jesus wouldn't take would just lead them to his cross, but that the way to Jesus would take them to their own cross. See, discipleship, following Jesus in the way, is more than just accepting Jesus as Savior. I mean, if that's all that was involved, then, then we've reached a destination. I need to be saved from my sins, so I need to accept Jesus. I've confessed him. I've been baptized into him. Now my sins are forgiven. Deed done. Destination reached. Discipleship is more than just accepting Jesus as Savior. It's accepting Jesus as sovereign. It's saying to Jesus from now on, you're my master. And every day, I'm going to be learning from you how life is supposed to be lived in the kingdom of God. Discipleship is more than just a retirement plan. It's living under the reign of God right now. And this is not radical. This is, this is learning to be normal in the kingdom of God. And, and so all throughout the Gospel of Mark, he uses, uh, unlike other Gospel writers, Mark has this little phrase that he continues to use over and over again. The phrase is, on the way, on the way. Read that little Gospel of Mark and notice how many times that little phrase is used. And he's talking about Jesus from the very start, on the way, ultimately to the cross. Notice in Mark chapter 10, when he meets Bartimaeus, a blind man, and he heals him of his blindness, Jesus said to him, now go, for your faith has healed you. And instantly the man could see, and he followed Jesus along the way. Now some of your translations say, follow Jesus along the road, but it's the same word. And Mark is saying, you know, basically that's discipleship. Jesus is on the way to his cross, and you follow him. So I want to ask you this morning, how did becoming or being a good Christian, as we would define it, become little more than an, an expectation to be nice to other people? You know, being a Christian today in our world, by my, many people's definition, is simply, I'm a good neighbor, I'm a good citizen, and I don't cuss very much, okay? And the problem is not that we don't have a lot of people in the church, but that we don't have a lot of people in the way. 
We've got too many who rely on Jesus for the next life, but they don't take him seriously in this one. I mean, let's be honest. How often are we tempted to domesticate and accommodate about what Jesus said on how to live our lives to fit into this real world? Because Jesus knows a lot about how to get us to heaven. We believe that. But we don't think he's really got much of a clue on how to live in the 21st century, right? I mean, he said, do good to people that hate you. Well, that's absolutely nuts. I mean, people will walk all over you if you do that. He said, if you've got two coats and you see someone who doesn't have one and you've got two, why do you have two? Give that one away and don't ask for it back. And we say, are you crazy? People will take advantage of your generosity if that's how you live. He said, guys, are you having trouble with lust? Well, you need to pluck out your eye and do whatever radical is needed to be done to get your get whatever it is in your life that's causing you to lust. Well, you can't do that, Jesus. This is the 21st century. We're just guys and everybody's got to look a little uh, every little bit every now and then. That's just keeping it real. Jesus said, don't worry about what you're going to eat or drink. Well, if I don't, who will? He said, don't store up treasures for yourself on earth. Well, I've never heard a single financial advisor ever say that. If I don't take care of myself, who's going to? You bet I'm going to store up treasure. I'm going to store up all I can. That's just good business sense. You see, that's the point. We know Jesus knows a lot about getting us to heaven. We just don't think he's got a clue about living life here today. We think Jesus is good. We just don't think he's very smart. And the result is we get stuck in our discipleship. I've shared with you before, there's a really interesting bike race that they hold uh, every year in India that's, that's unlike any other you've ever seen or heard of. All the bikes line up at the starting line, the gun goes off, and the goal of this particular bike race is to see in a certain amount of time who can travel the least distance. I mean, the gun goes off, your foot has to come off the ground, and you're balancing on that bike, hoping that it's not going to even inch forward. And as long as you can stay balanced on that bike, you're okay. But the moment you lose your balance and your foot comes off and you touch the ground, your race is over. So you, you see how long you can stay balanced and how short of a distance you can go. And the person who goes the farthest in this race is actually the loser. The person who has gone the least distance is the winner. Know any Christians who've been working really hard at keeping their balance in the Christian life? They're, they're, they're in Christ, but they aren't going anywhere. They've been a Christian 5, 10, 15, 30 years, and they're basically at the same place today as they were when they entered into a relationship with Christ. Let me ask you a really difficult question this morning. If you did not believe in Jesus, how different would your life be from what it is today? I mean, really think about it. Let's say you didn't grow up in a Christian home, and many of you might not have. Let's say you didn't have any Christian friends, you didn't have any church exposure growing up. If you didn't believe in Jesus, how different would your life be? Well, obviously, if you didn't believe in Jesus, you probably wouldn't be here today right now, and you'd probably cuss a little bit more than you do, I imagine. But is that all? Is that all the difference it's making? Because if that's it, Christianity is just your hobby. And forgive me, but you've got a lame hobby. Go out and get yourself a real hobby. Take up golf, you know. Take up knitting or crocheting or start scrapbooking. Christianity is supposed to be not a hobby, but a way of living that makes no sense to people unless they believe Jesus is really smart. That's 
what our first brothers and sisters believed about him. That he wasn't just good, but that he knew more about how to be fully alive in this life than anybody they had ever heard. They had heard him say in Luke chapter 9, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. See, they understood he wasn't just talking about life and death. That he was talking about learning to be fully alive. You want to embrace life like God meant for it to be known? Then die now and follow Jesus now. Yeah, that's radical. It, it won't make any sense to people who don't think he's smart. But then again, it's not supposed to. Listen to Erwin McManus's great little book, The Barbarian Way. He says in part, Somewhere along the way, the movement of Jesus Christ became civilized as Christianity. We created a religion using the name of Jesus Christ and convinced ourselves that God's optimal desire for our lives was to insulate ourselves in a spiritual bubble where we risk nothing, sacrifice nothing, lose nothing, and worry about nothing. That Jesus' death wasn't to free us from dying, but to free us from the fear of death. Jesus came to liberate us so that we could die up front and then live. Jesus Christ wants, us, wants to take us to places where only dead men and women can go. You see, the call consists of making radical daily choices to get in the way. Because every day Jesus is going to put a cross in your path and mine. He's going to say to you and me, pick it up. You pick up that cross today and follow me. It won't make sense to anyone else, but you trust me in this. Over the years, we've learned how to be the church and be in the church. But how to get over getting in the way. We've lost our name, and we've forgotten who we really are. The early Christians understood you couldn't have it both ways. And the life that some would label radical made perfect sense to them. And it still does to some people today. There was once a time when it was just understood that if you were going to get in the way, you were going to have to pay a price. And it made no sense to do that unless you believed that Jesus was good and that he was smart. But then you knew the price of getting out of the way would be even greater than that of getting in the way. So my plea to you today is don't become a stuck Christian who has learned how to be in the church, but who has gotten out of the way. So I want you to bow with me right now, and I want you to start, I want you to start the prayer in your, uh, on your own, where you are, and then I'll close our time. But just start your prayer this way. Dear Lord, show me some specific part of my life where you keep putting a cross in the way. And I keep trying to get it out of the way. You pray that prayer. And I'll close our time together. Let's bow. And Lord, I pray today that you would give us the courage to do the very thing that you're putting on our heart. The very thing we've been afraid to do. Help us to take up that cross and get in the way. Because the one we follow is good and he's wise. He is Jesus, the Savior of the world. And he's our Lord and Master. And it's in his name we pray these things. Amen. Now listen, if you're ready to join the number of those who are in the way, you want to be in the way. You want to be baptized into Jesus and 
follow him as your Lord and Savior. We're going to encourage you to, to uh, take a moment to speak to us, to ask questions that you may have so that we can uh, put your heart at ease about what's involved in making that decision. Those of you who are listening online, if, if that's something you're concerned about or have questions about, please feel free to contact us and uh, we'll lead you in the, what the scripture says about getting in the way. But thank you for joining us today and uh, we look forward to seeing you next week, if not in person, then again online. God bless you all.